Good day. As I make this video, there are reports coming in, or at least claims trickling in, of a drone attack of some kind on a Belarusian airfield, a field, an airfield in Bel Belarus, where uh, supposedly or allegedly a Russian A-50 mainstay um, airborne warning and control systems aircraft um, was uh, located. And supposedly, or at least the claims assert, that this attack was carried out by Belarusian partisans and that they inflicted damage upon this aircraft. Now, I have to say, as of this time, as of the time of the making of this video, I've seen no confirmation of this at all. I'm not sure whether this is true or not. The Russian Ministry of Defence has issued no statement about it. The Belarusian Ministry of Defence denied that there'd been drone attacks on Belarusian airfields from Ukraine. Didn't mention anything that might have been done domestically. So without corroboration, without some photographic evidence, I don't think this is something I really want to discuss in any great detail. What I will say about it is simply this. I think we should take claims that Belarusian partisans were involved with a gigantic mountain of salt. I notice that the British media is repeating that claim entirely uncritically. I think that Belarusian partisans almost certainly don't exist, at least not in the organised form that would be necessary to carry out an attack of this nature. And I have little doubt, personally, that Belarusian partisans are simply a cover story for a Ukrainian attack, a Ukrainian drone attack on this particular air base. Now, I don't know, as I said, whether there was such an attack. I don't know whether it was successful. I don't know the nature of the airplane that was damaged. If one was damaged, we will presumably at some point get more information. There'll perhaps be satellite photos. There'll be something to tell us what exactly did take place, if anything, at that, that airfield. I would say that there's been a very interesting uh, statement from uh, Mr. Ignat, who appears to be the Ukrainian officer who's in overall charge of Ukraine's air defence system. And he has provided what is surely intended to be an interview which acts in a complementary way to this attack, if an attack has indeed happened. And Ignat does provide some insight into the Russian methods of operation. He says that when the Russians launch um, Geranium-2 attacks, drone attacks, on Ukraine, they arrange for an A-50 AWACS aircraft to be flying um, in Belarus and the A-50 is there but it keeps track, monitors the launch of Ukrainian air defence missiles and over time this has enabled the Russians to develop a very accurate picture of the state of Ukrainian air defences, the nature, extent, depth, organisation of the Ukrainian air defence system. So one can understand why the Ukrainians might want to attack an aircraft of this nature. Now, i would seen in the British media claims that the Russians only possess nine of these aircraft. Um, Wikipedia says that 40 A-50 uh, mainstays have been built, which is obviously more than nine. I don't know how many of these are in service, but I would have thought that most of them were. They are, after all, important aircraft. The 9 might refer to a modernised version, the A-50U, which is a modernised uh, version of this aircraft that started to enter service in 2017. But anyway, one way or the other, if one of these aircraft was damaged, 
the Russians are certainly able to replace it. And besides, I'm pretty sure that they can repair it as well. So presumably they will be trundling it back on a lorry to Russia. It'll be refitted there, or perhaps another one will be built. And in the meantime, it will be replaced by another, and more precautions will be taken, no doubt, to secure the airfield and to prevent such attacks taking place again. So it's a pinprick, like many of these Ukrainian drone attacks have been. It's not a major blow. It's something that the Russians have to take into account. It is, after all, a war that has been fought in Ukraine. The Russians still refer to it as a special military operation, but to all intents and purposes, it is a war. And in a war, every so often, one experiences losses. And if this aircraft has been damaged or even destroyed, well, that's one of those losses. I'm sure that, as I said, the Russians can find ways to replace this aircraft. So I'm not going to say more about this than that. Um, no doubt we will have more news over the next couple of hours and we'll be able to find out more about whether this attack did indeed take place or not and if it did, what damage it actually did. Well, so much for that. Let's deal with the actual events on the battlefield and um, over the last couple of hours we've been getting a cascade of reports from around Bakhmut and it does now definitely look as if the fighting in Bakhmut is coming to a terrible conclusion. I say terrible conclusion because the humanitarian losses in this battle are horrific and it looks as if they're going to be more horrific still. Um, it's difficult for me, with my difficulties to read maps, to understand exactly the nature of Russian movements. But it is clear that over the last few hours, um, the Russians have been advancing rapidly um, in various places in and around Bakhmut. It seems the pincer that's pushing from the north has advanced very aggressively and is pushing forward um, at a rate of kilometers, several kilometers every day now. The Ukrainians tried to slow its progress by blowing up a dam, but that doesn't seem to have slowed the Russians to any significant degree. And it seems that the Russians are now um, almost astride the last main road leading into Bakhmut. And the southern pincer is indeed being reactivated and it does seem as if they're now once more engaged in a serious attempt to capture Ivanovka, this village astride one of the other main roads leading into Bakhmut. And on TASS, which is of course Russia's official news agency, we have a series of comments from Jan Gagin, who is an advisor to Denis Pushilin, the acting head of the Donetsk People's Republic. Now, uh, what Gagin tells us, obviously, you have to accept that he is speaking on behalf of the Donetsk People's Republic, which is now, according to Russian law, a part of the Russian Federation. And, um, obviously, um, you have to take these biases in his words into account. But nonetheless, he does provide an interesting take on the position. And he gave an interview early this morning, and I'm going to read the TASS report of what he said. And the TASS report reads as follows. Russian forces have cut off all supplies to the Ukrainian forces in Artyomovsk, Ukrainian name Bakhmut, and all roads to the city are under their control. Military political expert Jan Gagin, an advisor to the acting head of the Donetsk People's Republic, told TASS on Monday. Artyomovsk, i.e. Bakhmut, has been encircled. Our forces control the roads leading to the city. 
The supply of ammunition to the Ukrainian garrison has been disrupted. The rotation and replenishment of manpower has been stopped, he said. Gagin stressed that the Artyomovsk trap would be locked soon. In fact, he said Ukraine has lost this crucial logistic hub and with it thousands of soldiers and mercenaries and a large amount of equipment. So that's what Jan Gagin said. Now, note, he says that the Russians have cut all of the roads leading into Bakhmut. I have to say, some information I'm getting suggests that's not quite happened yet, though it does seem to be imminent. But anyway, it does seem as if the main roads are now becoming quickly unusable. And he says that um, Artyomovsk, in other words, Bakhmut, has been encircled. And he goes on to say that the supply of ammunition to the Ukrainian garrison has been disrupted. And he talks about the Ukraine, the Artyomovsk, in other words, Bakhmut, trap, being locked soon. Now, I don't know how soon is soon, but I'm guessing that Gagin, at least, given what he's just said in this interview, expects that the trap will be locked within the next few hours, perhaps in a day or so. Now, he might be right about that, he might be wrong, but it's clear, it's clear to me that that's what he thinks. And um, we have some reports, which, of course, I cannot corroborate, that the Ukrainian number of Ukrainian troops in Bakhmut itself is around 7,000. So they are presumably caught in this developing trap. And I suspect that the trap actually will include other Ukrainian troops just outside Bakhmut, though I'm not going to try and make guesses as to their precise number. So that's what Jan Gagin says, and all of the information that I'm getting suggests that's correct. And I say information because there's been a cluster of facts, of things happening on the Ukrainian side that, in an odd sort of way, seem to corroborate this report. Firstly, we've had confirmation that President Zelensky has, without much explanation, sacked the Ukrainian general, who was in overall command of Ukrainian forces in Donbass. Now, I seem to remember that this gentleman was appointed to this position in a series of military reshuffles that Zelensky carried out, I think, in March. And um, he was appointed to this role then. It did make me wonder at the time why that reshuffle happened then, but he's been in overall command of Ukrainian forces in Donbass ever since. We've been hearing repeatedly how successful he has been in resisting Russian advances, this particular general. But now he's been sacked. And that suggests to me that perhaps he's been prepared as the scapegoat in case there is a situation where this trap is indeed locked. Anyway, that was one fact which led me to think that this piece of information is probably true. The second is a rather curious one, and I suppose I'm stretching it a little when I say it is corroboration. But last night, uh, there was a whole little fire on parts of the Ukrainian internet, part on, on Ukrainian channels, and by the way, also on Twitter, um, claiming that the Ukrainian forces north of Bakhmut had car carried out some clever manoeuvre and had launched some kind of counterattack and had successfully recaptured Paraskovievka or were on the brink of doing so. And that, in the words of one tweet, the northern pincer of the Russian forces had become dislocated and that the entire creeping encirclement of Bakhmut that the Russians were engaging in had 
accordingly been derailed. Now, I have to say, when I saw those reports last night, I was extremely sceptical about them. They seem to be so contrary to the whole trend of the fighting that I found it very difficult to believe that that was indeed what had happened. And as the hours progressed, the claims of this U successful Ukrainian counterattack slowly faded, and eventually we got more reports, reports which I consider are considerably more reliable, saying that no such counterattack did in fact happen. This was all an imaginary event, and in fact, on the contrary, Ukrainian positions north of Bakhmut, far from having been rectified by a successful counteroffensive, uh, that the Ukrainian positions have actually weakened and that the overall Ukrainian position has in fact deteriorated. And I'm sure that that is the actual case. Now, these sort of fanciful reports of successful counterattacks tend to circulate when things are going very badly wrong. There's a people retreat into wishful thinking. They come up with all sorts of um, accounts of successful counterattacks, of the enemy being caught off guard, thrown on balance. And, of course, in war, sometimes, no doubt, things like that do happen. But they haven't happened very much in this war, and it seems that they didn't happen in this case. And the very fact that reports of this apparently imaginary Ukrainian counteroffensive were circulating, I take those as a sign that people who are reporting on the fighting in Bakhmut from the Ukrainian side are becoming increasingly desperate as the bad news pours in and are now clutching at straws, even when those straws are actually figments of someone's imagination. So that's what I get to say about that particular counterattack. So it does seem to me as if we are now not just at the end game of the Battle of Bakhmut, but at the closing part of the end game of the Battle of Bakhmut. Once the lock of the trap closes shut, well, we will be in a different position. Um, we will be in a situation where the troops, the Ukrainian troops in Bakhmut, are caught in a cauldron, or a trap if you prefer, and where the Russians, for their part, will be wanting to secure the trap by pushing outwards and we'll see how that plays out, and we'll see what the Ukrainians do, and if they do try to launch some kind of counter-offensive to try to relieve the troops in Bakhmut. Very unlikely, in my opinion, to be successful, but there we go. But anyway, it will be a different kind of fight from that point on. Now, I've compared the Battle of Bakhmut um, to Stalingrad, that obviously one has to say straight away that the scale of these battles, Stalingrad and Bakhmut, is completely different. Stalingrad was a battle involving millions of men. This is a battle which has never um, involved more than tens of thousands of, on each side. So the scale is totally different. But I'm starting to think that perhaps an even better analogy, analogy would be Dien Bien Phu which is an important battle fought in the north of Vietnam during the French-Indo-China Wars of the 1940s and 1950s, where a French military force trying to defeat Ho Chi Minh's Viet Minh army in north Vietnam, which is fighting for the independence of Vietnam and for the establishment of a socialist system in Vietnam, communist system if you prefer, well, anyway, the French, who were trying to defeat this force, managed to get themselves trapped in a place called Dien Bien Phu. And there was a battle that went on for many, many, many months. And eventually, the French were defeated. They were forced to surrender. And this caused the 
progressive collapse of the entire French position in Vietnam. Well, I may be pushing it a little when I compare Bakhmut to Dien Bien Phu, though it does seem to me that the scale of the fighting is probably closer to that of Bakhmut than Stalingrad was. But Dien Bien Phu was a decisive battle, and I'm beginning to wonder whether Bakhmut will also be a decisive battle in this war. Um, to reiterate again points that I've made in previous programs, um, Bakhmut apparently sits atop the transportation hub of the Ukrainian defences in Donbass, um, the defences that link up the various parts of the so-called Zelensky line, the line which the Ukrainians have built to hold their positions in Donbass. And it also is relative to other cities further west, Kramatorsk and Slavyansk, it is the high ground, or at least it controls the high ground. It may be in a kind of sort of gentle valley, but apparently um, the ground rises west of Bakhmut if the Russians are able to capture this high ground further west of Bakhmut, as they seem to be doing, then that brings Kramatorsk and Slavyansk within artillery range, and not just within artillery range, it means that the Russians are able to look, overlook on these, these two towns. So that's, I think, where we are. I think we are getting closer to a position where if Bakhmut is captured, maybe the war overall continues, but the Battle of Donbass, which is the major battle that's been going on in this war, the battle that's been fought out since April um, with extreme intensity and whose focus has been for many months now, since late July, has been Bakhmut. Well, the Battle of Donbass, well, maybe it's not immediately at an end, but we are coming closer to the point when it ends. And the Battle of Donbass is probably the decisive battle in the war, in the sense that if the Russians clear Donbass, gain control of the entirety of Donbass, they gain control of the most heavily industrialized region of Ukraine, they've fulfilled their political objective, the one that was set at the very start of the war by Putin, which was to secure Donbass, which is, of course, now, as far as Russia is concerned, Russian territory. And, of course, what they've also done is that they've deprived Ukraine of what was, in effect, its shield. Now, I've discussed the human geography of Donbass very often. I've compared it with the rural region of Germany, Others, like Big Serge, have done so as well. It's densely populated. It's highly urbanized. It's, there's lots of small industrial towns all linked together by a dense network of roads and railways. And those towns often include large factory complexes and high-rise buildings which are natural fortresses. This type of landscape is not repeated anywhere else in Ukraine to anything like the same degree. And specifically, the Russians, having cleared Donbass, would have a relatively open path to the Dnieper River. And they could advance to the Dnieper River, they could bring themselves to positions opposite the key industrial hub on the west bank of the Dnieper, which is Dniepro, Dniepropetrovsk, as the Russians call it. And that would bring the Russians to the center of Ukraine, and that would be 
an existential crisis, or so it seems to me, for Ukraine. In my opinion, if Donbass falls and capturing Bakhmut may be the key to the capture of Donbass, if Donbass falls, then we're no longer talking any longer about the Battle of Donbass. We're talking about the Battle of Ukraine, because Ukraine's position will then become critical. Critical to an extent that it has never been at any earlier point in this war. So that's the importance of the situation today. And I'm going to make a guess that there's lots of people in all the military staffs across Europe, in the United States, of course in Russia itself, in China, in all the other major countries that are fully aware of this and who are watching the situation very closely. So that's the situation, the military situation. Now, again, as I wish to repeat, the fighting isn't only going on in Bakhmut and in, Dom, uh, in Bakhmut. So uh, Pushilin himself, that's to say the acting head of the Donetsk People's Republic, also gave an interview, and he is saying that the Russians have successfully held on to all their positions in Vugladar. He said, positional warfare, and I'm reading again from a TASS dispatch, positional warfare is underway there, in, is underway there, he means in Vugladar. The enemy constantly attempts to counterattack and tries to improve its positions and retakes its lost sites. However, the Russian units withstand the enemy's attacks quite successfully in complex conditions and try to improve their positions whenever possible. And so Pushilin is saying, in effect, that um, for the moment at least, it's the Russians who hold the initiative in Vugladar. All Ukrainian counterattacks in the Vugladar area have been unsuccessful. And Pushilin also talked about another area of Donbass, of Donetsk region, he spoke about Avdevka, which is, of course, this major urban centre. It's about 30,000 people near to uh, Donetsk city. And Avdevka is the main position of the Ukrainian forces near Donetsk city. The Russians have been gradually working their way towards it, but it's been extremely tough going in very heavily fortified terrain. Particularly, this is a particular area where the Ukrainians have built the most elaborate fortifications of all since the 2015 fighting. And Pushilin said the following, and again, this is a quotation from Tass of an interview he gave to the Russia 24 uh, television channel. He said, Avdevka is a major area for us in the Donetsk direction. There are certain successes here. Units of the 1st Army Corps, that is, by the way, a force of the Donetsk People's Republic, it's part of the Donetsk militia, are accomplishing their objectives there, moving forward and improving their positions. It is early to talk about specific communities, but we have seen major gains there. So, Bushilin claims... And again, I have no way of either <laughs> confirming this or um, contradicting him that the Russians are making gains in um, Avdevka. And he's also saying, and this is again Pushilin, that there's been more advances in other parts close to Avdevka, close to Donetsk. And now he's talking about Marinka. And he says, as for Marinka, we see improvements and our units are moving forward. So stiff resistance by the enemy there has, of course, stalled the expectations, considering that it is redeploying reserves to the area. We expect it to liberate Marinka much sooner. And that's an admission, in effect, that the Russians do not fully control Marinka, despite claims, many claims, that they did so. It seems that the Ukrainians were able to um, hold out, to cling on to some 
positions in the in the outskirts of Marinka, but nonetheless, overall, he seems to think that the Russians are indeed making significant process in Marinka. And last but not least, we've had another um, official of one of the other um, of the other uh, Donbass Republic, the Lugansk Republic, Andrei Marochko whom we've heard from many times, a retired lieutenant colonel of the Lugansk People's Republic. He tells us that Ukrainian forces tried to launch a counteroffensive near the city of Kremenaya for the first time in a while, but retreated after suffering unjustified losses. And Tass again quotes him, the enemy tried to launch a counteroffensive against our advancing units. Uh, uh, and Marochko added that Ukrainian forces had suffered huge losses along the Kremenaya front line in the previous week, and their command chose to bunk, hunker down in order to restore the combat capability of their troops. Senior military officers failed to reach the desired number of troops and the necessary amount of weapons, and ignored reports from commanders on the ground about troops being unable to fight, but still they ordered to launch an offensive yesterday. And Marochko pointed out that the move caused unjustified losses to the Ukrainian armed forces, making them retreat to their previous positions. So what Marochko is saying is that the Russians pushed the Ukrainians onto the defensive in the Svatovo Kremenaya area. The Ukrainians tried to rebuild their forces there, but before that was successfully accomplished, and perhaps refusing to accept the fact that it could not be successfully accomplished. Senior command of Ukraine, perhaps that means Zelensky himself, ordered a counterattack, but it was pursued, conducted with insufficient forces, and it failed. So we have a situation where the Russians are apparently confident about the situation all along the front line in Kremenaya, near Donetsk, in places like Vugleda and Marinka, um, and in Avdevka itself. They're more than holding their ground, or so their officials are claiming, and I've no real doubt, reason to doubt this, but the key events remain in Bakhmut, and it does seem there as if there's been a major breakthrough by the Russians, that the pace of events, as I said, since the start of January, when Solidar uh, first came under attack and then was captured, has accelerated, and it's now increasingly looking as if the whole position, the Ukrainian position in Bakhmut, is about to collapse. So, that is my summary of the military situation. Now, um, on other fronts, there's been a very interesting article in Bild Zeitung. This is a German tabloid, takes a very tabloidy approach to media coverage. Um, it's um, fiercely fervidly pro-Ukrainian, but it is also sometimes surprisingly well-informed about the thinking that's taking place at high political circles in Berlin. I've noticed that, to an unusual degree, surprising in a tabloid, it's sometimes unusually well-informed about top-level thinking within the German government. And Bild Zeitung says that the European leaders, by which one means the leaders of Germany and France, have decided that unless President Zelensky and the Ukrainians are in a position to make significant territorial gains by the autumn, by the mid by midsummer, unless they're able to achieve some kind of breakthrough by that point, then Germany and France will present 
some kind of joint ultimatum to Zelensky that he must sit down and talk to the Russians and agree peace with the Russians. And, and if he doesn't, well, we don't know what the terms of that ultimatum are, but presumably it will take the form of some kind of threat to switch off um, further military support for Ukraine. Now, I have to say, I take this Bill Zeitung report with a certain degree of cynicism. And the reason for that is this. Um, firstly, uh, it's quite likely that the Germans and the French will, at some point in the autumn, pre present Zelensky with some kind of demand to sit down and negotiate with the Russians. And for all I know, they might be saying to themselves that they're going to couch it as some sort of an ultimatum. Um, but the reality is that what they would presumably be threatening to do, which is to cut off weapon supplies to Ukraine, is, if all the information we are getting is correct, be what they might have to do anyway. Because we're now getting more and more reports, the latest is from the Spanish defence minister, by the way, that NATO is almost out of ammunition to send to Ukraine, and that they can't really send any more, and that the stock of ammunition is about to run dry, and might presumably run dry at some, at some point in the next few weeks or months. So they might be threatening Zelensky with stopping ammunition supplies, but perhaps we should see this with a certain degree of cynicism. They might be thinking of doing that because, realistically, they have no other option but to stop ammunition supplies to Ukraine in the summer or early autumn because they have no more ammunition left to spend. How much more impressive to do that? How much more impressive to stop supplying ammunition, supposedly, in the event of a refusal to act on an ultimatum than to admit to the dreary truth that you've run out of shells. Anyway, that's what I tend to think about this. Now, of course, telling Zelensky that he must sit down and talk with the Russians is all very well. But I've already said, if the talks are going to be of the nature discussed or set out in that Wall Street Journal um, article that was sent to me by Joe Laurier of Consortium News, and which I discussed in my video yesterday. Well, all I can say about that is that the Russians will not accept terms on that basis. They will not agree to a situation in which Ukraine makes an offer of peace, but insists on its right to be rearmed to the ultimate level by the Western powers, as apparently the United States, Blinken, and the Europeans apparently um, suggesting or talking or discussing with each other. But anyway, we will reach that, we will see whether that point, whether we all ever reach that point, whether we ever come to that point. But anyway, in the meantime, I've had more reports about the state of Western forces. And there's a report in Germany which says that only 30% of German Leopard 2 tanks, the Leopard 2 tanks actually um, in use on the by the German army, the German army's own Leopard 2 tanks, only 30% of them are apparently in a proper operational condition. And there's been all kinds of reports that um, the situation in other NATO countries is even worse, that um, Spain is, its Leopard 2 fleet is in an even worse condition than Germany's is. 
It makes one wonder, by the way, why all these countries bought leopards too. So maybe they were, maybe this is another case of people buying tanks more because of the money that gets passed around than because they really want to um, equip their militaries with them. But anyway, I'm not, I'm not going to discuss that in this programme. Um, there was also some, about some days ago, a very interesting article in the Daily Telegraph by Tim Stanley talking about a meeting of uh, the House of Commons Armed Services Committee, or probably not got his name exactly right, chaired by the British MP Tobias Elwood, who is a notable hardliner where uh, the Ukraine war is concerned. Anyway, there was apparently a whole group of officials there from the military explaining that, in fact, Britain has no typhoon jets to spare, which it can send to Ukraine, and even the tank stocks are not really in very good shape. So, as I said, the French and the Germans might say grandly in the summer that they're presenting Ukraine with an ultimatum, but the reality is that they would probably do that if we get into that situation in the summer, because the cupboard of weapons by that point is actually bare. Now, that's all I'm going to say about that, but there has been one other development, and it is a very serious one. Now, over the last week or so, uh, ever since the political crisis in Moldova has deepened, the government there has been uh, making all kinds of threatening noises um, towards the opposition forces. When I say the government, I should say the new prime minister, the president, Maria Sandu, who is very committed to Mol integrating Moldova into the Euro-Atlantic structures, uh, dismissed the previous government and has appointed a new government with a, apparently a rather more hard-line prime minister. Anyway, there have been all sorts of warnings and threats which appear to be directed at the opposition, which appears now to have majority support in Moldova and which has been holding protests against the government. But along the way, this prime minister also made um, threats to, or rather made demands for the withdrawal of the Russian peacekeeping con contingent from Transnistria. This is a region in eastern Moldova, where uh, there's a large Slav population and where there was a conflict in the early 1990s and where, following UN resolutions, there is a Russian peacekeeping contingent. And this um, prime minister demanded that this Russian peacekeeping force be removed and he fairly openly indicated that he is seeking to assert the control of the central government in Moldova over Transnistria, which has a very high degree of autonomy from the rest of Moldova. Well, following these statements from this prime minister, there were a whole cluster of reports of a significant build-up of Ukrainian forces on the Moldovan border and of the Ukrainians considering some kind of a advance into Transnistria, um, presumably in order to defeat this Russian contingent, which apparently numbers around 1,500 men, of whom 400 are from Russia, presumably officers and non-commissioned officers, full-time cadres, in other words, full-time professional cadres. Most of the troops, however, are actually local people who have been allowed to enlist into the Russian military. But anyway, 
a relatively small force. The Ukrainian army will steamroll in. Uh, Moldova has no border with Russia, so there's no direct route through which Russian forces could reach Moldova. And the idea is that the Ukrainians would subjugate this territory and they, that would consolidate presumably the Moldovan government of Maria Sandu, and um, it might also have a further effect in that there is a very large ammunition dump in Moldova left over from the Cold War with supposedly something like 20,000 tons of ammunition stored there. And given that Ukraine is suffering a ammunition crisis, that would supposedly supplement Ukraine's ammunition needs. Now, on that issue, Ukraine's ammunition shortage, I've seen some more up-to-date figures on the actual amount of ammunition Ukraine uses in any particular day. And the figure that's been most quoted in the Western media is that Ukraine launches around five to 6,000 rounds of ammunition a day, artillery ammunition. Um, this uh, report suggested that, in fact, it's less than this. It's probably, more accurately, around 3,000 rounds of shells a day, far fewer than the 20,000 rounds of shells that the Russian artillery routinely launches on any particular day. And that, I suspect, is correct. I remember one Ukrainian official saying a couple of day, uh, weeks ago that on certain days, Ukraine is only able to fire around 1,000 rounds of ammunition in any particular day. Sometimes, in moments of particular crisis, they can perhaps increase that to 5,000, but an average of 3,000 a day does seem to be more plausible. That is nowhere near enough, and as I've said, the NATO stock of rounds of ammunition that they can supply to Ukraine is now running bare. So the idea is the Ukrainians will capture this big ammunition depot left over from the Cold War with 20,000 tonnes of ammunition stockpiled there, and that will, at least for, the t for a certain period, solve their ammunition problems. I have to say straight away, I don't believe it. I think that any ammunition st stored in this depot since the Cold War is now going to be, well, 32 years old. <laughs> I understand the shelf life of a shell is about 20 years. It seems to me that most of this ammunition is probably unusable. And I'm guessing that if the Ukrainians do try and use any of these shells, they will be as dangerous for themselves as they will be for the Russians that they try to launch them at. So anyway, that's just an aside. But anyway, there have been warnings, lots of warnings, that the Ukrainians may be thinking of launching some kind of strike towards Moldova. And I think that they might do it conceivably, but more as a, for political reasons. I don't think it's the ammunition stocks that are attracting them. I think that it would be a quick and easy victory over a Russian force. It would gain a lot of international publicity. It might take away attention from Ukraine's imminent catastrophic defeat in Bakhmut. It might revive morale in Ukraine, and it would conceivably, in fact most plausibly, strengthen the pro-Western and pro-Ukrainian government of Maria Sandu. And against a force of just 1,500 Russian soldiers, it would be an easy thing, at least in theory, to pull off. Well, the Russian Foreign Ministry has now issued a statement, and it should make very ominous reading, and it is essentially addressed to Ukraine. Now, we don't yet have an official translation from the Russian Foreign Ministry, 
So what I'm going to provide is a part machine translation. Um, I've sort of tidied it up in a few places. But I don't think you can, I don't think it's the meaning is particularly difficult to follow. And it reads, statement of the Russian foreign ministry in connection with the preparation by the Kiev regime of a military provocation against Prinestrovia, that means Transnistria. In connection with the significant accumulation of personnel and military equipment of Ukrainian units near the Ukrainian-Transnistrian border, as recorded by the Ministry of Defence of the Russian Federation, the deployment of artillery firing positions, as well as the unprecedented increase in flights of unmanned aircraft of the armed forces of Ukraine over the territory of Transnistria, we warn the United States, NATO member countries, and their Ukrainian wards against taking their next adventurous steps. We consistently support the solution of any issues through political and diplomatic means. At the same time, no one should have any doubt that the armed forces of the Russian Federation will adequately respond to any provocation of the Kiev regime and will ensure the protection of our compatriots, the Russian peacekeeping contingent, and the military personnel of the operational group of Russian forces and their bases in Transnistria. Any action, and this is the key sentence, any action that poses a threat to their security will be considered in accordance with international law as an attack on the Russian Federation. In other words, the Russians are warning Ukraine that if they do advance into Transnistria, Russia will treat that as an act of war. Now, how does that change anything? We've seen that Ukraine and Russia have been fighting each other for almost, well, for a full year now. <laughs> the uh, Ukrainians talk about it as a war. Most of the world does. I do. I refer to it as a war. But the Russians refer to it as a special military operation. They still continue to do so. And there are probably legal constraints. In fact, there are undoubtedly legal constraints on what the Russians do, which follow from that. The Russians up to this point, for example, have been reasonably restrained in some of the attacks they've launched against civilian facilities. They've also avoided launching attacks, as they've said, on the decision-making centres in Kiev, on President Zelensky and his officials, and on the defence ministry there, on the various command posts of the Ukrainian high command. Now, if there is an attack on the Russian Federation, Presumably, all those constraints disappear. And as far as the Russians are concerned, at that point, Russia will be at war with Ukraine. And the Russians will then, presumably, feel more free to do some of those things which many people ask why they haven't done, which why haven't they done them? They are, would be more free at that point to do them. Now, I think that in NATO capitals, this is taken seriously. And I've noticed that um, various NATO governments, including, by the way, the government of Ru Romania, appears to be warning both Moldova and Ukraine against an intervention of this nature. And the Moldovan government itself, Maria Sandu's government, also seems to be cooling on this idea of a Ukrainian incursion. And uh, Maria Sandu has, for example, appeared in recent days to rule out Ukra uh, Moldova joining NATO, 
which is something of a reversal on her part. And the Moldovans are saying that they're not, they don't want an intervention by Ukraine on their territory. Well, we'll see whether that holds. But I'm going to venture a guess that with the crisis in Bakhmut deepening, with the situation for Ukraine going very badly in Donbass, the temptation to win an easy victory in Transnistria must be growing in Kiev. And I can easily imagine that at some point all doubts or caution will be thrown to the winds and an advance to Transnistria might indeed be ordered. At that point, the Russians might indeed say that this is an attack on them. In other words, that Russia is in a state of war with Ukraine. And of course, at that point, the Russians might say that they're no, no longer in a special military operation type situation and that they can do some of the things that I've talked about in this program. Now, one immediate consequence of the Russians being in a state of war with Ukraine is, of course, that it frees their hands as to what they might decide to do beyond the capture of Donbass. If they want to, for example, march on to Kiev and affect the overthrow, the forcible overthrow of Zelensky's government, then an attack on Transnistria might give them the legal grounds upon which to do it. I'm not saying that that is necessarily what the Russians are going to do, but perhaps people both in Kiev and in Western capitals might want to bear that in mind. Anyway, that's me again for the day. More from me soon. And in the meantime, let me remind you that you can find our programmes on multiple platforms, on Locals, Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram and Rockfin. And you can also support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar, links under this video. And of course you can go to our shop and buy the things that you will find there, our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts and all such things. And last but not least, um, please um, remember, if you've liked this video, to press the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. Thank you for joining me again. More from me soon.